location will be provided by Rabbi Shea Bernstein, uh, Shabbat, Shabbat downtown, downtown San, Jose, San Jose, and SJSU. And um, Rabbi Bernstein has been leading Shabbat of SJSU since 2016, and Shabbat DTSJ since 2019. Rabbi Bernstein also serves as the Jewish chaplain at the Santa Clara County Main Jail in Elmwood. Raised in Toronto, Canada, and studied in schools across the world, Israel, New Haven, Connecticut, Brooklyn, New York, and Los Angeles, where he received his rabbinical ordination. In addition to serving in a volunteer capacity to Jewish communities in Germany and the island of Grenada, Shabbat DTSJ serves our community through a variety of programs they offer, including Mommy and Me is a series of innovative classes that allow moms and their kids to experience Jewish tradition in a stimulating, fun, and creative environment. First Saturday of the month for a Shabbat prayer service, followed by a Kiddish lunch, women's morning classes, weekly Torah portions, one-on-one -on -one study, Gan Shalom preschool. Shabbat SJSU serves the students and faculty at San Jose State University by offering a variety of educational, cultural, and religious programming as well. In the five years that Rabbi Bernstein has been active in SJ, he has positively touched and impacted the lives of over 300 students and faculty at SJSU and over, a one, over 1,000 individuals and families in our city of San Jose. Welcome, Rabbi Bernstein. Thank you. person uh, and virtually via Zoom. In ancient Jewish tradition, we start with a lighthearted, lighthearted story to get the discussion started on the right foot, so I'd like to share with you a short story. A small child was in need of about $100. Finding no way to procure it, he decides to turn to God. He pens a letter, and in it, he writes, Dear God, I'm in desperate need of $100. Please send. And he puts it in the, in the, in the envelope and addresses it, to God and drops it in the mailbox. The mailman receives it. He doesn't know how to forward it, so he fi figures, we'll send it to the president's office. Sure enough, the mail gets forwarded, and somehow, by some miracle, perhaps God was listening, the envelope lands on the president's desk. The president reads it, and his heartstrings have been tugged, and he feels like this is a wonderful story. He'll send back $10. Sure enough, the child receives the envelope a few days later, addressed from the president through Washington, he opens it up and there's $10 inside. The child sits down to write a letter to God and he said, he writes like this, Dear God, thank you for sending the $100. Please don't send it through Washington next time. They always take 90%. <laughs> I'd like to share with you today a universal message uh, that I believe is more important uh, and, uh, and crucial than ever before. Uh, you may be familiar with something called the seven Noahide laws. Uh, Noah, of course, is the person in the story of the flood, uh, and it's called the seven Noahide laws because according to that story, we all descend from Noah, uh, and so really it's a universal message. The seven Noahide laws are commandments that all of us should keep, regardless of who we are and where we come from. Without those seven things, it would be impossible for humanity to live together in harmony. I'd like to list them out and elaborate briefly on each one. Uh, they are, number one, do not profane God's oneness in any way. Acknowledge that there is a single God who cares about what we're doing and desires that we take care of this world. Number two, do not curse your creator. No matter how angry you may be, do not take it out verbally against your creator. Number three, do not murder. The value of human life cannot be measured. To destroy a single human life is to destroy the entire world. Because for that person, and in some sense their families and loved ones as well, the world has ceased to exist. It follows, therefore, that by sustaining a single human life, you are sustaining an entire world. Number four, do not eat a limb off of a living animal. Respect the life of all God's creatures. As intelligent beings, we have a duty to not cause undue pain to other creatures. Number five, do not steal. 
Whatever benefits you receive in this world, make sure that none of them are at the unfair expense of somebody else. Number six, do not engage in forbidden sexual relations. These include incest, adultery, and rape. The family unit is a foundation of human society. Intimate relations can be so powerful. But when abused, nothing can be more debasing and destructive to the human being. Finally, number seven, establish courts of law and ensure justice in our world. With every small act of justice, we are restoring harmony to our world, synchronizing it with the supernal order. This is why we must keep the laws that have been established by our government for the country's stability and harmony. Today, in this room, we're mostly focused on number seven, uh, which is the establishment of government and good legal practice, uh, but the other six are just as crucial as well. On a final note, today is a Jewish fast day. It's not Yom Kippur, you, may have, you would have known if it was, uh, but there are other fast days on the Jewish calendar. Today is the 10th of Tevet, uh, which marks the siege of Jerusalem uh, of old, about 2,500 years ago, and the, which ultimately, leads to, ultimately led to the destruction of the temple. The Talmud describes how instead of uniting against the common enemy that was attacking the city of Jerusalem, Jewish factions, Jewish factions inside of Jerusalem battled with each other over rulership and over power and the correct uh, direction to take the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, the Talmud teaches, because of baseless hate between people, Jerusalem was destroyed. My mentor and teacher, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, asks, why does the Talmud insist that it was baseless hatred? If you read the story closely, it wasn't baseless at all. It seems as though there was ideological, pragmatic reasons for this division. Certainly, there, would be, there are some valid re reasons for their disagreements. But the Rebbe answers, and I'd like you to take this message home, that no reason is ever enough for hate. The commonality of our fate runs so much deeper than any possible cause for animosity. All hate, then, is baseless hate, hatred. If baseless hatred was the cause of the destruction of the temple, says the Rebbe, it is a remedy, it can be remedied by baseless love. Our rediscovery of the intrinsic unity, which overrides all reasons for discord and strife. L'chaim to healing and bettering our society one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Bernstein. It's a pleasure to have you here, and thank you for sharing your insights. All right, we'll move to our ceremonial item. Uh, Councilwoman Perales will join me at the podium. We're going to recognize and commend the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Task Force. We have a few members of that task force here. All right. Well, thank you. Today, we are here to recognize members of the Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force. And uh, although my office did convene the task force, it was actually members of our community uh, that came together to actually form initially the concept of, uh, and then the structure and the members of a task force back in May of 2020 at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. The mission of the task force was simply put, to inclusively put forward solutions that will revitalize the greater downtown San Jose area by supporting the recovery of businesses and community organizations while fostering interest and confidence in public life in a COVID-19 impacted world. The 60 members of the task force met completely virtually over 60 meetings uh, between May and December of 2020. During that time, they put forth 58 different recommendations spread across the city, the County Board of Supervisors, and to our governor's office at the state. Um, many of these recommendations were implemented or helped informed our recovery efforts and ultimately helped inform as well the creation of our citywide COVID recovery task force. I wanna personally commend uh, all the task force members because during the pandemic, Besides trying to survive economically on their own, these individuals chose uh, to not throw in the towel and instead they fought for a seat at the table as decisions that affected their livelihood were on the line sometimes daily. And thanks to them, they helped spur the creation again of our ongoing efforts for our citywide recovery task force. Um, and 
we are thankful for every member of the task force, and we are here uh, joined today by our co-chairs of the task force, Wisa Uemura, the executive director of San Jose Tyco, Cash Bourne, owner of Haberdasher San Jose and Cash Only, and Dahlia Rastin, co-founder and executive director of New Ballet. Uh, and it is my pleasure to ask the mayor to provide each of them with a commendation for their efforts. Um, and I don't know if somebody is, is interested in speaking, but so we'll, we'll hand it over. So thank you. <laughs> On behalf of my co-chairs here and the 60 members of the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Task Force and its eight cross-sector committees, I thank the mayor and council members for this commendation. Special thanks to Council Member Perales and his outstanding team at the D3 office for stewarding, convening our task force and stewarding this process. We're proud of the collaborative work that we were able to accomplish, and it's our hope that this intention and spirit will continue through the new citywide recovery task force, this council, and other initiatives to achieve the necessary public health, economic recovery, and equity for all San Jose individuals, businesses, and nonprofits. Thank you. All right, uh, next up, Tony's gonna make sure we're all here. Let's call roll. Jimenez. Corrales. Here. Cohen. Here. Carrasco. Present. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Arenas. Here. Foley. Here. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Lepardo. Present. And Jimenez is here as well. Okay, great. Uh, he is present, yes. Okay. We're on to the orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? I'm actually just pulling up Zoom now, so maybe Tony, you can help me if anyone's got a hand up. I have no council member hands up. Okay, we'll move forward then to the closed session report. Nora? Thank you, Mayor. We do not have anything to report out of closed session today. All right, thank you, Nora. Um, item uh, on the consent calendar, we'll ask if anybody on the council would like to pull any items. Uh, let me note that I think staff would like to pull item 2.11, which is the lease extension naming rights for San Jose Muni, because there are changes to the recommendation that need to be read into the record. So we'll call that in just a moment. Let me ask my colleagues if they have any items. Okay, Nancy Klein is here ready to read uh, changes into the record for item 211. So let's pull that item now. This is again, lease extension naming rights for San Jose Muni. Mayor and Council, Nancy Klein, Economic Development Mayor, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, worked to extend the lease for the Giants for a, a period of 10 years in total. And on December 7th, the Giants identified that a change of ownership for the club has taken place. Uh, it, the leadership of the Giants, Dan Orem, will stay uh, as is. It's just technically needing to read in uh, the new owners to reflect the accurate information. So the resolution should state authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute an amendment to the amended and restated lease between the city of San Jose and the San Jose Giants 
doing business as San Jose LLC DBH. That is the entity that now owns the Giants. Regarding the municipal stadium located at 588 East Alma Avenue, including all ancillary documents necessitated by the amendment to extend the existing lease for a period of five years with one option for DBH to extend the term for an additional five year period and approving the agreement between the Excite Credit Union and DBH for the sponsorship of the San Jose Municipal Stadium and the continued naming of San Jose Municipal Stadium as Excite Ballpark, home of the San Jose Giants for a period of 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And could I just ask, Nancy, uh, could you, is there anything you could tell us uh, about the ownership? Are, are they local? Uh, is it a uh, corporate entity, uh, individuals? DBH, uh, Diamond Baseball Holdings, is owned by Endeavor. And when you Google Endeavor, they're a very significant entertainment company. And in this process, they are shedding some assets and taking on other assets. The, um, the CEO of DBH is closely entwined with MLB, with Major League Baseball. And um, his corporation, DBH, is now going to own nine minor league teams. So this is, we are port part, and it looks fortunate because it'll be um, additional funds where the Giants didn't have as much funds previously. Okay, great, thank you. All right, and thank you for your work in negotiating that agreement. Uh, great to have uh, the sponsorship and support uh, minor league baseball here in San Jose. Council Member Sparza. Uh, I just wanted to say that this is a great partnership um, and thank them for <clears throat> extending uh, their support of the Giants and uh, move to approve uh, consent. Second. All right. Uh, that's the entire consent calendar. Is that right, Councilor Sparza? That's what you said. Correct. Okay. All right. Let's take public comment this time. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, happy end of the year to everyone. As the current Omicron variant uh, may not be so threatening through this winter, I still hope Santa Clara County local governments can continue to find open creative ways to talk about the, the COVID-19 vaccine process and its nanotechnology with everyday community. Alameda County with a very strong Democratic Party base does not yet have a vaccine mandate for its local government workers. Why do you think this is? I hope Santa Clara County, the city of San Jose, and the city of San Jose will want to reconsider mandatory vaccine ideas. And at this point, good community health and safety ideas may also may also be uh, to consider uh, what can be good forgiveness plans for local government workers and people who will be uncomfortable with taking this vaccine. Uh, items 2.14 and 2.18 uh, includes uh, smart outdoor light management with Wi-Fi infrastructure for. Uh, East Bay, uh, East Side uh, Union High School District issues. In the next few months at this time, can we all better consider uh, the good ideas of reimagine, equity, open public policies and accountability? As this can be an overall more well-rounded approach to local neighborhood law enforcement needs along with digital equity questions. Items 2.17 and 2.20 is a reminder of local dumpster days can be a very good way to bring all parts of the community together on a Saturday morning. Item 2.21 is uh, with a charitable gift drive for uh, Evans Lane Transitional Housing Program. I hope we can have an open conversation uh, about uh, the future use of federal state uh, subsidies for people of ELI and BLI. It's money meant for, uh, that's, and that's money not meant for speculation by rich housing developers. And an overall good luck that we can rally to ask the CPUC and PG&E to learn a better reasoning how the entire solar industry process continue to allow to grow uh, as, and to become more open and accessible to people of low income and to low, uh, local community energy programs. Thanks a lot. Paul Soto. Good morning, Council. This is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, um, with reference to uh, number two on the, on the calendar, on the agenda, it states clearly that uh, that the public has a right to um, request uh, 
items pulled from consent consistent with the uh, any council member. It's on par with that. So with that in mind and, and observing that, which is on the agenda, I would like a 2.18 pull. And uh, that's number one. And in addition, um, this consent calendar is, it's there's too much of a consistency where it's being stacked with issues that really require a conversation. There's items such as 2.18 that were discussed on a, uh, on a regular agendized level. They didn't go through consent. And now the application and the follow-up work with all of those conversations are going through here. And I think that they, considering um, the East side has been uh, majorly, majorly impacted by uh, lack of infrastructure, lack, lack of uh, uh, digital infrastructure, that I think that it warrants uh, more of a conversation, more of an open conversation, so we can get some things on the record. You know, and, and, and that's one of the things that, that uh, that's one of my contentions is that there isn't the council or the public being able to put things on the record with respect to certain items. And I think that's a, that's a viola well, it's, it is a violation of the law. And you like referencing the law that prevents you from doing things. Well, on this one, you're actually preventing democracy from occurring. So I would like to uh, see that pulled. Thank you. Tessa Woodmancy. Okay. Thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate that. I wrote a letter to our uh, attorney in regards to that. Never heard back, of course. And, you know, um, this is what democracy sounds like, is what, what Paul is bringing to our attention. So thank you, Paul. And, you know, in regards to the consent calendar, as I was listening, um, because I didn't do as much research as Paul does for everything, um, but I was listening that um, uh, Blair was talking, oh no, before that, we, they, um, our economics director was talking about the giants. And so I was, okay, well, that's interesting because what, what we're dealing with is, you know, supporting issues like we did with the SAP center, uh, of of building uh, of car infrastructure car car based events and not changing the way we're we're um, handling these these projects. Um, you know how many cars will be going to the uh, the the um, the giants or the SAP center, and so how we're we going to change that. And what my husband says, you know, we can't like you know be dictators and say no cars, but we have to pay to play is how he says it, and so we need to have real costs involved in, in, in creating, if we're going to create for that SAP center, a big shop, you know, a parking lot or anything, we they have to pay immensely because of the cost. We're seeing the cost in what happened in the middle of our country with our, uh, the climate crisis that we most recently had with the 30 tornadoes, you know, coming to us and destroying that whole community in the Midwest, many states. And these are the costs. That, that have to be put into our, our system of, of that, you know, the giants having, you know, that if they're going to have cars come, they have to pay a lot to have that, just like the SAP center, so we can build our transit center. Back to the council. Thank you. All right, uh, let's vote on the consent calendar. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Tony, I apologize. Um, I was having trouble with my uh, mute button. I'm on uh, a yes as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Spars, I know that your hand is up, but I believe that's from before. Is that correct? Correct. I'll lower it right Great. now. Thank you. Okay, we're on to the report of the city manager 3.1. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I have no report today. Okay. Um, given the the large number of substantive items that I expect we're going to hear today, I'm going to uh, limit public comment to one minute. 
so we can ensure since we were in the final meeting of the year, we can get through this all by midnight. Uh, so we'll take up item 3.6, approval of the issuance of tax exempt multifamily housing revenue notes and the loan of proceeds for the Mariposa Place affordable housing development. That is the one located on West San Carlos. There is no presentation on this item. The staff is here to answer questions. Uh, is there a Move motion? approval. Motion of Council Member Foley, second of Council Member Davis. Uh, there is one member of the public who would like to speak. Tessa Woodmancy. Okay, good. Tax exempt family housing revenue notes, tax exempt. Um, well, I think that is a, a good idea, a loan of proceeds. Um, we were, there's another item that's coming up in regards to housing that is dealing with not having the commercial underneath. And, you know, that's very, very important that we stop doing that as the, um, that we really focus on our housing crisis as our uh, priority, as a human right uh, uh, to provide uh, the basic need of housing. And, and really it's food, clothing and shelter are our basic needs that we need to be focusing on. And so when we're, when we're our, our general plan has in it jobs that, you know, we're, we're trying to create locally, I understand that. But the thing is, is that the type of jobs that we're, we're, um, we're promoting and is not sustainable. So either we have to have that as part of our criteria. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, Mayor LaCardo, you had that plan the whole time. That's why this calendar was stacked the way that it was. You had it planned the whole time that you were going to limit uh, limit topics to uh, one minute. Thus, Paul, you, you please, took it upon you, yourself. Paul, can you, you please keep your yourself. comments on with multi-family ha housing revenue notes? Okay, I lost you. So let's move on to Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman here. Uh, watch when you start the timer, be careful with that in the future tonight, today. Um, you know, just a nice remind, important reminder of the importance of ELI, VLI, and mixed income ideas, what that can really help with the future of projects like this. Uh, projects for the San Carlos area, mixed income ideas may be really important for the San Carlos Avenue area in the future. Um, to, to also quickly consider, uh, you know, there's cigarette uh, tobacco uh, limitations being considered for multifamily housing ideas at this time. Um, I question it with, with the importance that we're working on tenants' rights issues and the like. I, it just seems the wrong time to consider how to better address uh, an obvious need to consider uh, the future use of tobacco and how to limit it, uh, perhaps talking to corporations more and working on uh, tax systems can be of help. Back to council. Thank you. All right, let's vote on the motion of council member Foley. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, I, item 3.7 are project labor agreement amendments. Welcome, Matt and, and Rachel and team. Thank you, uh, Mayor and City Council. With me today, Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director from Housing, and Chris Hickey with the Public Works Department. We don't have a presentation today at the appropriate point. Um, during council de deliberations, there's some feedback we'd like to provide. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, all right, uh, let's go to public comment. David Biddy. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, the San Jose Citywide Project Labor Agreement was adopted in large part for the numerous recognized benefits that PLAs provide to construction users, including increased prevention of wage and hour violations, promotion of local apprenticeships, and providing well-paying family supporting careers for local residents. Placing more projects within the scope of the PLA will increase all of these benefits. It will decrease the misuse of public funds on public construction, 
and it will increase the volume of access to direct pipeline for community members to obtain placement in building trades apprenticeships. And these highly prized education slots provide family supporting careers with both healthcare and retirement benefits and leave graduates with marketable skills and zero school debt. The hard work on implementing this PLA has already been done. The processes are in place and the projects are moving forward. The addition of more projects will have a significant impact on, on the community and for local workers. I urge you to adopt these recommendations. Thank you. Tessa Woodmancy. Yes, um, we've got to look at the issue of the, the labor unions um, and how they have an impact on our, our growth. We just keep growing and growing to create jobs. And we saw that the whole thing with, you know, even with our transportation and our BART, it was all about jobs. And this is what I'm seeing as we're growing so many office buildings in San Jose. You know, we don't need office buildings. We need to work at home. And that is what we discovered. And then to be building these large um, buildings, like I'm seeing, uh, you know, anyway, the one that's coming out near my house. I mean, there's so many of them that are happening. And we don't need office buildings. And, and we're using so many of the Earth's resources. They're saying almost two Earth resources we use every year. And we have to stop growing. We have to degrow. And so everything about jobs, we have to reconsider, you know, basic, um, uh, basic universal basic income and changing things. And so everything, you know, supporting jobs has to change. Nicole Goring. Good afternoon, Mayor and San Jose Council. Nicole Goring with Associated Builders and Contractors State and Federally Approved Apprenticeship Program. Uh, we've got uh, several partnerships with Goodwill in the community. We've done several cohorts and have put people like Vietnam veteran Eugene Delaney into our laborers program and Victoriana Washington and people like that, people deserving a second chance are now unable if the passage of the joint apprenticeship program are gonna be unable to work in their community, in the city where they live, in the city where they're trying to rebuild their lives and careers. Our apprenticeship programs are among the top in graduation rates and in quality. And I just don't understand why you would wanna limit our apprentices and the skilled and, and trained construction workers living in the community from being able to have the opportunity to work on projects in their city. I urge you to reject this policy. The, the bids are working fine without the PLA. Your recent bid went to a local contractor, 21% under the engineer's estimate. Joe Lubis. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Joe Lubis. I'm an independent policy analyst. And I just want to uh, highlight a few uh, times which PLAs have you know, been failing it was at the east side union high school district the dw baseball and softball field improvements was estimated at 1.8 million it was contracted for 2.4 million and that's 640 thousand and 36 percent above estimate the education center essential building systems project had a cost to exceed amount of 4.4 million change orders have brought it up to 4.7 million the dw site improvements had only one bidder due to the other bidders being deemed non-responsive uh, in short, there's no need to uh, uh, increase the amount of city projects that will be subject to these types of failures. Please, please, please do not uh, widen the scope. Thank you. Louise Auerhahn. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships USA. I founded and directed the Trades Orientation Program, TOP which is a partnership with Work to Future, San Jose City College, the Building Trades Apprenticeships and public agencies, including the City of San Jose. On a volunteer basis, we play the role of the Community Workforce Coordinator for the current San Jose PLA. Due to the limited scope, so far only seven projects under the PLA have actually been eligible for targeted hiring. But on just those seven projects, 32 underrepresented community members have been placed and gotten their start in a skilled trades apprenticeship and a lifelong construction career. Expanding the PLA to more projects will help expand those opportunities to more people in our community members and make sure that those are open to all, regardless of where you come from, your background, whether or not you have family in the business, we really want to make this a level playing field. Paul Soto. Uh, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. Um, we saw demonstrated 
in the shadow of the Thomas Fallon House, slavery, in, it, in, its most, in its most simplest terms, it was slavery. Okay, so um, working partnerships and, and South Bay Labor Council, they, couldn't, they didn't prevent that. Okay, and that was sickening to me because what it told me is the lengths by which the developers will go. I don't care if it was a subcontractor. Ultimately, the person that is building that building, they are ultimately responsible. Okay, and those men were enslaved inside of a container in downtown, in San Pedro Square. Oh, but we're going to roll out the red carpet for them, right? And just get, just, yeah, okay, you guys can get whatever you want. South Bay Labor Council and working partnerships are corrupting the system and allowing that type of slavery to exist in this city. I take offense to that, and I hope there's somebody on this council that's going to do something. To Back to council. All right, uh, Council Member Cohen. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to um, make a motion just with a little bit of explanation. Um, we, our project labor agreements um, ensure that our um, people hired to do projects for the city have good working conditions, that they're provided with worker protections, um, and that they're able to build skills through a, a committed a, apprenticeship program. Um, we have had a working project labor agreement that has a, a level that's higher than the jurisdictions around us. Um, it's important that we allow more projects to have these protections for workers and offer these good jobs. So the proposal is to um, make uh, some very simple changes in the text of the project labor agreement that will reduce the project threshold from $3 million to $1 million um, and make a few other changes to ensure that uh, more people get the benefit of the project labor agreement. Um, there's also a couple of uh, other clarifications put in there to allow to help um, Matt Kano and his staff and Public Works um, ensure that language is cleaned up in, in cooperation with the labor partners in the project labor agreement. Um, so I want to move um, our memo, the memo from um, Council Member Esparza and myself, along with Council Member Reynas's memo. I do want to just oh, thank you. I do want to just point out um, that I think it's important to make sure that apprenticeship programs that are included in these are jointly approved by labor and management. That just ensures that these that these apprenticeship programs are committed to the workers. That workers won't be replaced from project to project. That they will um, that there are good apprenticeship programs in place that will ensure lifelong skill building and not um, uh, bring workers in from, from out of town when possible, but making sure we have local hires who are uh, offered um, uh, long-term apprenticeship, which will help them build a, a, a career. So um, I will also add, I'm sorry, I will add to that motion um, item uh, two from Councilmember Jones's memo um, to just return to council in one year with the analysis of these changes. So I'll, I'll make that amendment if that's okay with the seconder. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. Um, it wasn't that long ago that we were going through this process and uh, I remember because I was actively involved that um, we had dueling um, reports, dueling analysis, dueling opinions on whether PLAs were um, going to add to the cost of a project, how it, it would impact small and local businesses, the, the level of competition, and um, again, multiple studies that were presented to us with different conclusions. And it was really difficult to, to really uh, decide or land on what the right answer is gonna be. Uh, I think this is an opportunity to um, at least do a pilot or a test and have our own facts here in the city based on a year's worth of data to determine whether um, adjusting the threshold for the PLA and expanding the, the projects that would be incorporated would have an impact on those critical areas. So I wanted to um, ask you, Matt, in terms of, is it 
feasible and possible to take a year's worth of data and come up with some type of uh, analysis and conclusions to, to give us accurate and you know, specific data as it relates to the city of San Jose. Hi, Vice Mayor, thank you for your question. The annually, as, as, as you would to in your memo, we do report to the CED committee on local and small business participation on public works projects. Our next report is coming to committee, I think in January. We, as part of that annual report, we can do analysis on PLA versus non-PLA projects. And that should be, it's a little extra work, but it should be relatively straightforward. And we, what we'll be able to see is any trends, um, if, but we, we'll be able to see annual, on an annual basis if local and small business participation is growing or not. Um, since if this, um, if this recommendation is accepted today, most of our projects moving forward would have PLAs on them. So although we would be able to see trends, um, it would be difficult to understand whether what is impacting those trends. But we can definitely report back on local and small business participation uh, as part of our annual report to CED committee on, and then we can differentiate between PLA and non-PLA projects. And, and we'll see when we get there what we'll be able to decipher from those trends. Maybe we'll see something, maybe we won't. Uh, as far as resources are concerned, um, I know that you raised some um, questions and had some concerns about even your ability to staff and support uh, uh, the changes in the PLA agreement. Can you further elaborate on that? Thank you, Vice Mayor, for the question. This is what I alluded to the mayor. I'd like to, um, a few things I'd like to, to speak to today. And so this, this is the primary one. Um, and I wanna be clear that what I'm about to say is nothing about the pros or cons of a PLA. That is a policy decision that's in front of city council. Um, however, as the director of public works responsible for implementing along with some other departments, our ca city's ca multi-billion dollar capital improvement program. Um, I, I, I will need a manager to oversee this. Um, if not, I'll need to draw staff from other important work, whether that's minimum wage compliance enforcement in Chris's office or something else that I will need to figure out. Um, it is something that um, without an additional staff, I will need to do. Um, from a policy statement, this is to me, um, and I haven't been in public works that long, but it seems to be the most important policy statement that the city council is about to make for our multi-billion dollar CIP program. It'd be an umbrella over the whole policy. Like I said, it is my responsibility to ensure these workers are paid the appropriate wages for the work performed, and I take this responsibility very seriously. Um, PLAs are expanding rapidly throughout the region. I understand each union has a compliance department that monitors projects to the best of their ability and provides an extra level of enforcement. However, there's no one central entity out there other than me and Chris's team in my department that um, is, and there's no central entity, whether it's with the unions or the Building Trades Council that is proactively managing and making sure that PLAs are properly applied to City of San Jose projects. That's why, um, and that should be my responsibility. Um, and it is my responsibility and it will be no matter what. Um, there's a lot of work associated with this. We're increasing, if you look at the past year, we sent in about six new PLA projects out to bid. If these rules had been applied retroactively the past year, we would have sent about 32 PLA projects out to bid. Um, that's 32 pre-job meetings, 32 projects to track to make sure that the agreements between the unions and the contractor at those pre-job meetings are being followed. Um, 32 oppor more opportunities for my team to make mistakes if we're not being proactive. Um, and when there's issues that do arise, um, they are still complicated sometimes to resolve. They could involve interjurisdictional issues between unions, which um, sometimes can resolve themselves, sometimes uh, take a long time to resolve and are very complicated and the city does need to take leadership in that. So um, it is a significant extra workload for my team. Um, we will definitely implement whatever is decided today. Um, however, I think I, this is similar to what I said at rules and as someone who it is ultimately my responsibility to implement this and it should be my responsibility and, and that's why I've, I know that I need to put resources towards it. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and, and just continue on that, that thought process. Can, can you just put that in just, you know, real world execution terms? Sure. So we make the decision to um, uh, 
you know, approve um, Councilmember Cohen's uh, motion. Your task to to manage the, the, the program, the changes, the agreement. What does that actually look like? And, and just really sure. just real world, you know, tangible terms. Sure, thank you for that. And there, thank you. there are two parts to this. The first is updating the agreement with the Building Trades Council. We, we, we can do that. Um, I'll fit that in. Chris and I will fit that in. The attorney's office, uh, speak for Nora, we'll, we'll fit that in, um, the updates to the agreement. Um, what I was re referring to was once the agreement is updated and we're, um, you know, if well, six times the number of PLA projects that we currently have, um, needing to proactively have my management team understand the rules of those PLAs, ensure that the meetings with the unions at the begin beginning of the projects are happening and adhered to as the project goes on, that is a workload um, that I need to figure out how to accomplish. It's the so it is two parts: updating the agreement we can handle. It's implementing we will handle no matter what but I need to figure out how to put resources towards it. Okay, um, I, I just, you know, this might be, you know, sound a little extreme, but I just want to just get it out there. So um, what you're telling me then is you're not necessarily being set up to fail, or are you? I don't know that I'd put it in those words. I know, that was a little, that was a little <laughs> the, I, did, I did preface it by saying it was a little, I, extre a little extreme, but you know, I just I, wanted to get where that I out there. I view it is, it's is the, I, I don't, it's, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and answer it, and if I don't uh, satisfy your answer. How, how about, I'll, 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 actually, I'll, I'll, I'll change it to a more positive. <laughs> Are you set up for success? I'm How's not that? set up for success on this right now, right. thank you. Um, and. And I need to figure out how to, we will figure out how to be successful, but I'm not sure how to do that right now. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I also wanted to speak to um, the part of my memo that uh, addresses um, state approved apprenticeship programs. Uh, many disadvantaged um, community members go through those, those state approved programs. And as those of you who work with me know that I'm, I'm not a, um, either or person, I'm an and person. And if we can have apprenticeship programs that are union backed and union sponsored and we're getting quality individuals who are given an opportunity to get into the workforce, I'm all for that. But I'm also all for any program that's gonna uplift our communities. And so that's why I didn't wanna have a either or, I wanted to have an and in my proposal. So I'm not going to um, actually ask for a friendly amendment or a substitute motion at this time. I want to hear from my, my colleagues on their thoughts and opinions, and then I'll, I'll circle back and add a few more comments. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Perales? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so just along the lines of, of the, the commentary, and, and look, along, uh, for the policy discussion itself, um, I am supportive of the current direction here. I was supportive of that a couple years ago when we, when we were initially moving this forward and ultimately we came to the, the compromise that we have today. Um, uh, one that I didn't support. And so I, I, I think policy-wise, I'm comfortable with where we're going. What I'm not so comfortable with is, uh, Matt, what you're talking about as far as, uh, I don't hear clarity on what may be um, put aside. So do you just not know that yet as far as you know the workload or work um, you know priorities that you would have to, to set to the side as you've described? I, I don't, I haven't, I haven't done a deep analysis on what priorities would need to be set aside. How quickly do you think, say, considering this policy passes today, how quickly would you be able to, to come back to us and let us know, say, hey, here's what we think the, the additional workload's gonna be, and because of that, the implications will be, we're gonna have to you know, put a pause on X, Y, Z work. Thanks for that question. I, I feel very confident right now in knowing the additional workload. I know that in the early response form, I did put two FTEs. I, I, you know, we've had a lot of internal discussions the past few weeks, and, and one FTE would suffice um, um, for now. Uh, I think that would be enough um, for us to get by. Um, you know, again, that workload is making sure all the pre-job meetings are happening, and I know those are run in partnership with the Building Trades Council, um, um, and but making sure also that afterwards that those are adhered to, that they're being followed, that the agreements that are made at, at those meetings actually happen 
working closely with working partnerships to make sure that our contractors are actually following the rules for targeted hire and um, because that is extremely important and and also not just you know right now our target our, our work our um, you know targeted to hire our contractors um, aren't really forced to be proactive the way the agreement's currently written we want them to be proactive and if we have someone actively managing that would be really helpful so I, I feel very confident in the work in the workload um, I'm more passionate about that um, confidence in the, the, that we do need a work staff member than I am about a lot of things. Regarding what would be put aside, it'd be tough. I think it'd just be less if, if we didn't have an additional staff member. It'd probably be multiple things that um, Chris Hickey's team does. Um, I don't think it'd be one in particular thing. We probably would not be able to get to minimum wage enforcement uh, minimum for minimum wage enforcement we do we are reactive as an organization as a city we're complaint based purely and um, we would likely not be able to get to those complaints um, other than that there's not necessarily one thing that we would put aside it would probably be we would do less uh, proactive investigation of our capital projects um, our my labor compliance specialists would um, maybe do more cursory looks at many projects as opposed to the deeper dives they do on the certified payrolls right now. Um, so it'd more be a, in addition, probably minimum wage would be what I would recommend we really slow down on and everything else in Chris's group would probably just take a, a reduction um, as opposed to stop, stopping to do, stop doing things. Okay. And uh, it would likely be that, that projects that qualify for a PLA under this new program would ramp up throughout the year. Um, you, you stated there could be 30 something, or there would have been maybe 30 something plus um, this past uh, year, correct? Correct. And so um, I think obviously sooner than later would be better uh, addressed if we could help with this additional staff person. So then that way none of the other work had to be slowed down. Um, but at worst case scenario, we may end up having to address this during the budget, and, and that may be kind of the first half of, of next year where we're really running into maybe some challenges. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that based on your answer there that nothing's really gonna take a, a back seat. Um, I don't, I, you know, obviously we don't wanna overload staff, and I do think we would need to address this during the budget to ensure that with this policy comes a staff person um, and, and knowing that this first half of the year, that's gonna mean you're gonna have to prioritize um, you know, how you're balancing that. Uh, it could be the case that you're able to accomplish everything as, as effectively as you'd like, depending on you know, how many projects are moving or not, right? Obviously it's all um, subjective to kind of what comes forward. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and hear what my, my other colleagues have to say, thanks. Councilmember Davis. Thank you. Um, Matt, when I hear you talk about needing one FTE, you said to get by. Does that mean you would have one FTE and some work would still slow? I don't think so. I think, you know, we've, we could really, you know, two FTEs would, would be ideal, but one FTE would be enough uh, for this. Um, I feel comfortable with that. I don't think anything, nothing else would slow down if we had an FTE associated with this. Okay. And when you talk about needing to retrain your staff to proactively manage these projects in a different way, can you talk about the cost and the time for that? Sure, thank you for that. So we, this isn't something that a lot of people learn in engineering school. And there's some social classes in engineering school, but a lot of um, it's, and maybe with some of the newer engineers that are, um, uh, but anyway, this isn't something people will typically learn in engineering school, the, the social and policy side of prevailing wage and project labor agreements and why those are important and why those are important to the community. And, and so what, what happens is if they don't really, if my managers don't truly understand why the city is doing a PLA and why it's important to the city and why you know, building our city with our community is just as important to, as the structure that they're building, and uh, then they're gonna make mistakes. Um, it's possible that a, 
the contractor will want to bring a non you uh, a con bring in a sub just for a couple days work that isn't that doesn't and that doesn't go through the PLA process and doesn't call out to the union for the workers and and that project manager is not going to know any better and and they may think oh, it's not a big deal because it's just a quick thing and and, and that cannot happen under my watch and I don't want it to happen but if I'm not if I don't have someone out there continually training my team and educating them on the value of a PLA, the purpose of a PLA, and why it's important for the city, and the intricacies of how to work in the complicated union, union environment. Um, there's different rule, it, all unions have different rules, for example. Um, not all unions, but there's, there's a lot of different <laughs> rules uh, depending on union. Uh, so if we don't, again, as I mentioned before, this is a massive, really critical umbrella policy over our whole capital program and my project managers need to be experts in it in order for um, us to really get the value out of it we need and I'm worried about them making mistakes if they're not and so I think your question was the time to train um, we right now we not right now Chris will we'll be we'll need to train people multiple times a year um, and be that not only train multiple times a year but be that person people are calling almost on a daily basis to say, hey, what's a PLA? What is this? Why do we have to do this? Um, what is the reason for this? And so really, um, and I can't, and Chris is in a, in a division that's currently understaffed and he's up to here with work. A and I, I, I can't have him drawn away from that to be not only the person who does a training three or four times a year to all our managers, but also the person that gets daily questions and has daily follow-up. And so that's why, um, I don't need somebody 100% dedicated to training. That would be a piece of what this FTE would be doing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what happens if one of your project managers makes a mistake like that? What do you think is likely to happen? Um, what would like, it's possible that we would, a couple things. One is we may never find out. Um, another avenue is we find out right away and we can fix it right away, um, which, is, which is good. And, We'd ha someone may complain. There may be a complaint-based process where somebody else on the project figures it out and makes a complaint. We fix it right away. Um, what I would typically do is get on the phone immediately with David Binney from the Building Trains Council, and we'd figure out a solution. Um, if it's something that was found right away, um, the solutions are typically pretty easy. If it's something that we don't figure out until later on, months later, then it gets a little bit more complicated to figure out what to do. Um, because then we have to discuss issuing a notice of violation to the contractor. We have to involve um, the, the Building Trades Council and the union and come to some joint resolution about what happened, what are we going to do about it, who are we going to fine, how much, et cetera. And so um, it really depends on how quickly we can find it and fi find the mistake. And I'm just using this as an example. Yeah, I don't know that, I don't think we've, I, I'm not aware that we've made this mistake anywhere, but there is a real conversation I had with a project manager about this issue mm -hmm. um, that a mistake was almost made, um, which is why it is a real issue that I'm bringing up today. Thank you, and I appreciate that because the potential for making a mistake is much greater when you have many more projects and you have a lot more project managers who are overseeing these projects. So it is a concern, and it is a concern for me in particular because it sounds like if even if you catch the mistake early, there will be delays in these projects. Is that fair to say? Um, probably not a project delay. Um, project, to, unless there's something very significant, we, we, we would typically keep a project going. Um, there would just be a day, delay in the resolution of the issue, which if the issue involved um, the, the worker's paycheck, um, there could be a delay in the worker getting the right compensation amount. It would rarely impact the schedule for a project. That would have to be a pretty unique situation to do that. But it will increase the management costs of the project because there's already increased training, as you said. And I think we, I think we all know mistakes are inevitable. Hopefully they are kept to a minimum, but that increases the management costs of the project for the, on the city side at least on the city side. 
possibly, the, the reason I'm saying possibly is because there's some costs, uh, Chris's time, my time, Chris's specialist time, where we don't bill directly to projects and we're part of the department's overhead. So it's a, um, it, it couldn't, so I, I guess, yeah, yes. And if, if, we, if we make mistakes on projects, as a general rule, it could increase the cost of those projects for the, from the management side. Although I don't see that as a significant um, um, cost. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is uh, for Rachel. I see the supplemental here about uh, PLAs and the housing department. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. Um, so the, um, our, the Housing Department worked with Matt um, to provide a supplemental just outlining some of the concerns and potential impacts to affordable housing projects as well. So we just wanted to be clear. Um, and so really what we do is we see that there is potential for two areas of impacts that right now would be exempt from the PLA, but, but would be folded in with the new policy change. So the first would be um, large renovations to existing buildings. And this would be something that's over a million dollars. So it wouldn't, you know, obviously that's more, you know, a pretty significant rehab. Um, and so that's one thing that we're looking at. And then another would be, um, smaller like ex emergency interim housing um, site developments that we've been working on that would be um, eight units or below and also above a million dollars so yeah. it it would have to meet those two criteria and um, and then the PLA would be in place so again we just want to be clear and disclose to the council that we do expect there could be some impacts to our um, Really, I would say the the most impact is to our like our tiny home um, developments, that type of construction um, that hasn't been included in the past. And, and I just want to clarify. Thank you. No, that was, mm -hmm. thank you, Rachel. I want to just want to clarify, Council Mayor. The primary reason also that we put out the the supplemental memo was that there is a old council resolution that exempts affordable housing units under eight units from prevailing wage. So if today's action passes, um, even if an affordable housing project, so a, a $1.1 million affordable housing project um, of, eight, of under eight units normally would have been exempted from prevailing wage. If it has a PLA on it, um, the, then it would likely pay prevailing wages because that's what union wages are typically set at. So um, we wanted to just make council aware today for just for an awareness that um, that policy that exempts ha affordable housing projects under eight units from prevailing wage um, could be negated partially by today's action. Thank you. I'd like to ask the maker of the motion for an amendment um, to continue to have the city bid and awarded building rehabilitation projects to continue to be exempt per addendum C. So that we don't have these impacts to our affordable housing projects. I just think we're pitting two groups against each other that are that are deserving groups, and I, I would rather not have to do that. We're expanding the PLA. I understand what we're doing today, um, but I don't. I would like us to continue to build our affordable housing, especially our emergency interim housing as expeditiously as possible. And all this retraining that Matt is talking about, I don't want our affordable housing projects and especially our emergency housing projects to get gummed up in those work. Could you accept that amendment? Perhaps, I'm gonna ask the seconder as well. Um, I, 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 we'll get, we'll get I'll, I'll read some comments about the training issue later, but, um, but I, you know, my, to make sure that we, we're not, um, the whole idea here is to make sure that we're not exploiting workers for projects that the city is doing. So it's not clear to me that there really is sort of a pitting groups against each other in this case, except protecting. But I'll, I'll let me let me think about it. Hear what hear what our seconder has to say, and then we'll consider it as an amendment. I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying yes yet. I want to hear other input on that. Thanks. Okay. I have a, a question. Thank you. I have a question about it. 
so that I can understand it to see if I agree with it. Um, so this would it include the rehab, um, correct, Councilmember Davis? This would not include tiny homes where we have had wage theft? The city bid and awarded building rehabilitation projects that are currently exempt. Okay. Um, I'm open to it. Yeah. Okay, I, I'll accept it too then. Is, is it? Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Jimenez. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion, for the information. I just wanted to highlight something that uh, Council Member jo Vice Mayor Jones wrote in his memo. I think it's the second to last paragraph. It says level playing field between uni or I think he said we should be creating as a city policies that provide a level playing field between union and non-union. So I, I totally agree with that. I think oftentimes what my experience has been in talking to folks is that some of the competitive advantages that non-union non uh, contractors and entities have is really that they're not paying folks a fair wage or, or, or a living wage to be able to live in the area in which they're working. And so I, I think that's one of the challenges that the unions often have is uh, they can compete in every other aspect, the training, the expertise, yet the union and the wage staff and things of that nature make it very difficult to be able to compete with some of the folks that aren't abiding by that same sort of policy and, and uh, and work. The other thing I wanted to uh, ask about, so in my office, I often tell my team that I'm very much interested in trying to figure out solutions, right? And I know during the course of this conversation so far, it seems to me that we've had a lot of discussions about the impediments to getting some stuff done. And so one of the things that I've thought about as we're having this conversation, I can't help but think that there was a big entity not too long ago Actually, I suspect that they're still paying for, for some employees at the city, but I know that when the Google project came forward, they actually contributed to hiring planners, I believe, in the planning department. Is that, is that generally correct, right? Um, Nancy Klein can help me here. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, yeah, the, as part of any, uh, the Google project, similar to other major development projects, is um, paying for the services from our staff. Um, for Public Works is an example. They'll be paying the appropriate fees that I will use in Public Works to fund my staff that is working on their project. And so, right. Nancy, so, so, so Nancy, can I, can I ask you a question? Just, and you'll see where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're a little far off here uh, as it relates to the question about Google, but but Google, uh, can you refresh my recollection? So Google, and I think they're maybe still doing this, but as they're moving forward their large project, they're actually contributing some funds to helping pay for some uh, for some positions within certain departments to help move along the project. Is is that? Uh, the, Nancy Klein, thank you very much for the question, Council Member. Google is not paying for a position related to this effort. No, they, no, I'll, totally understand that. But, but what, I, what I'm trying, what, let, me, let me sort of piece together what I'm trying to ask. And so, so what I'm curious about is this. It seems to me that, Matt, uh, you stated that the implementation, and I know some of my colleagues have sort of latched on to the challenges in implementation, and the sense, or what I heard you say, is that it's gonna take about one FTE, right? And so the reason I bring up Google is that Google is an entity that recognizes it's gonna take a lot of work to implement their project and everything associated with that development. So what I'm curious about is, have we had conversations with say the building trades or, or some of these unions that, that you know, are interested in doing this, and I think likely the majority of council is interested in doing this, and asking them if they're willing to fund one of these positions to help facilitate some of this work. And that's where I was going. Mm -hmm. um, I have had conversations with building trades and working partnerships about the challenges um, that I face on staffing and implementation, but I have not made a direct request of them for any money. Yeah, and you should know I haven't talked to anyone about that possibility, about that idea, but I think in the spirit, yeah, thank you, Nancy, I think in the spirit of trying to find solutions to move this forward, if it is in fact the will of the council, and if you in your department is gonna be burden, let's just say, with, uh, with uh, managing this, I think it's important to start thinking or continue to think creatively about how we uh, fill some of those positions and if folks can sort of uh, get some skin in the game as it relates to funding one of these positions to help facilitate this, I, I'd be all ears and very interested in knowing that. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. I think it's a worthy conversation and uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Understood, thank you. Um, Mayor, one opportunity, there's one more thing I'd like to add. Uh, sure. 
That's fine. Okay. Just another item that, that as, as we all know, this is moving pretty fast, and, and there, there wasn't a staff analysis and staff report that, that went into this. And so one other item that came up, and I just wanted to put it out there for the council's consideration, and um, you'll make the decision, is right now the recommendation is to put the framework at $1 million um, and, and above. We do have a lot of things we're tracking in Public Works regarding our procurement processes. Um, and one thing that we have is the Director of Public Works' authority for awarding capital projects. And that was set at a million dollars, but increases by inflation every year. So now it's at 1.05 million. And our staff preference would be to have the PLA track that. So um, purely from a work standpoint with all the ma all the machine that we've got running internally in Public Works, so we don't have 1.05 million for this, 1 million for this, and more opportunity for mistakes. And so I wanted to put that out there um, for the discussion today. And, and it's obviously, you know, you're, you'll move forward with what you move forward with. Thank you. Let me just ask the uh, maker of the motion, they'd be willing to uh, uh, align the, the amounts. Yeah, since the numbers are very close, I'd, I'd be willing to do that. But let's, and that's all right uh, with the seconder? Um, how close? What's, what are we talking? It's um, one. Well, well, right now, the Directors of Public Works Authority increases annually with inflation. It goes, it, last year it went up by 50,000 from 1 million to 1.05 million. And so I'm just going to assume it's going to go up by $50,000 per year. Um, and if- So if it's within 50,000, yeah, I, I agree. I'm okay with that. Okay, the motion's amended. Uh, Councilmember Mayhem. And the, um, oh. Sorry, the amendment, just to be clear, the amendment is that the costs go up with inflation in line with the director's approval authority. Did I capture that correctly? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council Member Mayha. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just to start on a process point, I, and this is probably a question for Council Member Cohen and, and um, co-signers. You know, I don't have the benefit of having been through all the discussion and debate that the vice mayor referenced, but I'm just that there is quite a bit of complexity to these issues as we're hearing on the dais today. Is, is there a reason that this proposal didn't come to CED first for some analysis and conversation, especially since we um, implemented a policy in 2019? And um, I may have missed it, but I, I don't know what the results of that have been. There isn't an answer. I, I don't. I don't know the the process. I mean, I don't know why it didn't go to CED. I mean, we we brought it to rules because we we believe it's timely and important to get the council to make this change. It's an administrative change in terms of the agreement. Um, we had this conversation before, I think, at, at rules committee, and I guess I can ask Matt about that. But the the change itself is an administrative change to language in an agreement that already exists, as opposed to creating a new agreement or negotiating a new PLA. Yeah, okay. I, I, the reason I ask is just because I, I do, I've tried to read as much as I can on this in the last uh, week, and you know, I, I do share many of the concerns the Vice Mayor raised about um, escalating costs and the public therefore getting less value for their dollars, um, impacts on small and local businesses that, that uh, may be non-union, and um, have some concerns about excluding them from the ability to bid. So, um, you know, and just wrapping my head around this, I think I certainly would have preferred to have had a, some analysis and a longer conversation at the committee level before we rush into uh, making this decision or trying to hash out all these questions here on the dais. It just doesn't feel like we've had enough conversation here, and I certainly have unanswered questions. Um, and it does concern me. I also just note, you know, we're talking about needing to add more staff to manage more complex processes at a time when we know we're understaffing critical public safety functions, for example. We don't have the police officers and firefighters that we want. We've been unable to staff planning to unlock housing in our urban villages. We've constantly, we say we don't have enough staffing, and yet we're talking about uh, needing to staff up to manage more regulation more process. So I, I will say, I think we do all share the value of wanting to ensure all of our workers are treated fairly. I, I, I do believe that. I think we, we absolutely have a responsibility to ensure that when we're paying for a project, workers are treated fairly, have good working conditions, are paid fairly. And um, I'm concerned anytime I read about that not being the case. Obviously, it's a big and complex market. Things, things 
um, sometimes go wrong, and that's why the law is there, is to hold people accountable. So I guess a question I have is, um, maybe for staff, is, is one about alternatives. Are there other mechanisms that are maybe less onerous on us? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what currently exists to protect workers um, from wage theft or, or poor working conditions? Sure, thank you for the question, Councilmember Rahan and Chris will help me out here. Um, we currently have a team, Chris Hickey's our division manager in public works and he has some labor compliance specialists um, on our capital program. Um, you know, we are, um, you know, to say we review 100% of everything proactively would not be an accurate statement. However, we do proactively review certified payrolls, work with contractors um, and field complaints and, um, and look at other forms and processes such as apprentice forms that are submitted, et cetera, on projects to ensure that our workers are being paid. And our workers, meaning the workers that are working on our capital program, no matter who they're employed by, mm -hmm. our workers are paid the appropriate wage rates. Um, there's, and when violations are found, um, those are, the contractors are notified, those are fixed as quickly as possible. Um, frequently, we have contractors that fix those right away. Um, sometimes we have larger issues that draw out. Um, and, and, and so that is what Chris's team does to proactively enforce the wage on their projects. The, the a primary difference with the PLAs is to, uh, the wage rate is the prevailing wage, the, it's the same overall wage rate that is paid to the workers, whether it's a, actually, I'll, Chris can help on that, but the, the prevailing wage stays the same. The workers, depending on benefit packages and stuff, may may get less actual funding one way or the other. But the prevailing wage is the same on a PLA project versus a non-PLA project. But the PLAs do require that the majority of the workers um, go through the union when they're on the project. Um, so just on the point of violations yeah. quickly, and then I want to come back to prevailing wage. Thanks, because again, uh, you know, would have liked to have gone through this in CED to really, you know, dig into these points. But just since we're here, um, when there are violations, um, what, what what happens? I mean, do we continue to work with contractors who have intentionally? I mean, I assume some of the violations are just sort of administrative mistakes, and they get resolved quickly, and that's going to happen in in any business. But tell me a little more about what are the types of violations? Do we um, get to a point where we say this this contractor is someone we won't work with anymore. I assume sometimes there's legal recourse and they can they can get in trouble with the law. Can you just tell me a little more about that? Sure. Thank you for that question. And so right now there's not a formal policy, formal council policy on how much is too much regarding violations. However, we do have the ability to um, deem any even in our low bid construction process, we have the ability to deem any um, bid or non-responsible. Um, and so if there is a, a bidder that has just, it's too much and it's has had too many violations with us or we're yep. notified of too many violations somewhere else, we do have the ability to deem them non-responsible. We also have a debarment process in the city, which we used um, a few years back um, for a wage related issue on a contractor where we debar them um, and from working for the city for a number yeah. of years. Good, yeah, I'm glad we have accountability mechanisms. And then when it comes to prevailing wage, my understanding is we have a very tight labor market. Everyone's struggling to find skilled labor these days. Um, what, um, so, so my understanding is that wages, you can have prevailing wage with or without PLAs. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yes, uh, thank you for the question, council member. Uh, Christopher Hickey, uh, division manager for public works. Prevailing wages are required on most uh, public entity projects, when they involve construction, alteration, demolition, there's a, there's a long list. Uh, those wages are set by the Department of Industrial Relations with the state of California. They take about 104 different classifications, which they approve, and they set the rates. That ra the rates that are set are prevailing, uh, that have a basic hourly rate that should be paid to the employee, and then a set of fringe benefits. Uh, that include health insurance, pension, uh, uh, training, a, a big block of fringe benefits that sets the prevailing wage rate. Those prevailing wage, wage rates are either set statewide or go down all the way down to specific counties. Um, and, and that's, they change every single time, but they are required on 
all projects except for, as we discussed earlier, the housing projects of eight units or less. Right. So. Thanks, Chris. That's really helpful. So if we, um, Councilor Cohen, maybe you can help me understand this. If we, if we have local businesses that want to bid on city capital projects, they are in good standing with the city and have not been found to be in, you know, past egregious violation, intentional violation, and they're, they're in good standing, they have a good reputation, and we have already uh, prevailing wage with benefits negotiated in. Is that not a fair enough playing field? I'm, I'm trying to understand why this is necessary and, and ultimately the right thing for our community and our, all of our residents and our taxpayers. And it seems that there are many other protections and controls and maybe they could be strengthened and process could be improved, but try to understand why we need a rigid policy that's going to actually exclude local contractors who may be great employers and, are st and may be paying prevailing wage with benefits. I'll only say that this is the philosophical debate between having a PLA and not having a PLA, that the city has a project labor agreement and these are technical changes to the project labor agreement and no, no, I'm asking disagree. why, why, so. that's, why that's necessary okay. in the case where we have a responsible contractor who's paying prevailing wage. Because that's what we're talking and about doing, is actually further excluding those companies from bidding. I, I, don't, I don't want to get into the debate over whether a project labor agreement is right or wrong. We have a project labor agreement. I understand that there's a difference of opinion. I, I don't want to specifically get into the debate again about project labor agreements. We've, the council has adopted a project labor agreement. If somebody else, I mean, we have, I have another co-author on the memo too. I mean, I suppose you can ask her as well, but I'm, I, I don't think we wanted to get into the, the whole debate on whether we have a project labor agreement or not. We have a project labor agreement. Okay, well, I, I, I have a hard time. I mean, again, I wasn't here a couple years ago when this was discussed and debated. We didn't take this to CED to have a fuller conversation, not actually hearing a compelling reason why we absolutely need to do this right now. So I just, I'm, I'm having a hard time uh, getting to a point where I feel like I can I can support this right now. Thank you. Councilmember Sparson. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> um, I have a couple of photos that I wanted to share with my comments. If someone could um, pull that up, please. I appreciate it. Um, I uh, while those. Oh, okay. So here's one of them. While they're. Um, the reason I wanted to share the photos is I wanted to put a human face on uh, some of the apprenticeships that are offered during the All the Way Home campaign to end veteran homelessness. Um, we, it was to end veteran homelessness. And one of the things that we did was uh, really try and ensure some economic uh, self-sufficiency while folks were in shelter. And so we got a bunch of veterans and there's another photo as well. Um, we got a bunch of veterans from, um, so we could show the second photo, that would be great. A um, bunch of veterans from the VA, the shelter at the VA, um, from 10 Kirk uh, in District 5, um, and from Home First, from their veterans um, housing, that we were able to get veterans into the trade orientation program um, so that they could kind of shore up some of their training I don't know if they have the other photo. Do, do staff have the other photo? Oh, thank you. Um, so that we could shore up some training and education so that they could then go straight into a, a union apprenticeship program. And what's really cool is that um, many of the veterans, I, I, is this, is the photo up? I mean. Not maybe yet. maybe we could just use let's just use the photo that we have, but it won't show everyone. But the reason I wanted to show it is that we have folks in that photo that after um, after that training, they went to um, to directly into an apprenticeship program, and those are for the veterans that were in the top program. Additionally, we had veterans that went straight into an apprenticeship, a union apprenticeship program. And I was going to point out, the photo's not up, but I was going to point out some of the veterans that I ran into a year later that um, had, had jobs and, um, and 
were buying like their first cars and um, and really were enjoying uh, the economic benefits of having high quality training, being paid to learn while you trade, having the benefits. Oh, thank you. Those are the um, veterans um, that, uh, that went through the program. And I'd like to say the number one veteran of the class was, was um, one of the women out in front. Um, and the, the apprenticeship, they can play such an integral role in helping folks to turn their lives around, as well as providing opportunities um, from folks uh, you know, with some challenges to advance in a career that supported their families. Another one of the veterans that I'm seeing um, he had been homeless for 10 years. Um, he had been housed through the VA um, and, then, uh, and then was able to support um, his new wife and young child on a union job. And, and I bring this up too, because I asked a lot of questions myself during the roadmap exercise as we build back. We've talked about building back better from COVID, from this pandemic for the safety and well-being of our workers um, who are actually literally building the city's foundation. And so in that roadmap exercise, we, we had this conversation about, um, about supporting the city, supporting this work through the budget process. And then city manager Sykes um, assured me that while we wouldn't be able to take this on 100%, that this work was tied into economic benefits, um, addressing wage theft was tied into economic recovery, that this was something that we could do. So that's why I wanted to bring that up. Um, I also um, wanted to address the fact that staff had asked um, for one of the items in our memo to, for the cleanup language. Um, and so we offered that. So staff brought up that need um, and I also wanted to bring up the elephant in the room, which is we've seen recent examples and heard reports of recent city projects, um, which have been subject to wage theft, apprenticeship violations and production delays. And one of the benefits of PLAs is that enforcement improves with PLAs, makes it less likely to have violations or in one of these cases, um, allowed to, uh, the city to catch it earlier. Um, and, and I had um, a couple of questions for Matt. Um, so Matt, initially we were told that there would be no staffing difference um, between bidding with or without PLAs. Um, is that, uh, you know, can you be more clear? Because we, we were told, no, there would not be a difference. Um, and so can you clarify that please? Thank you, Councilmember Esparza, for the question. I, 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 I'm trying to recall the exact conversation. I think I know what you're referencing. So when, right now we do have a template form um, that it, well, we have, a, we have an agreement, a PLA, and we have a system in our procurement process that if a project has a PLA, we simply grab that there's our procurement team, amazing procurement team has a few different, temp, many different templates. And so if it's a federally funded project, we use this procurement template. If it's a PLA project, we have that procurement template. And so when I think I was addressing that question with you or your team, what I was referring to is as far as making sure that PLAs are attached to more projects, that is pretty straightforward because our procurement team just grabs the, the template that has a PLA on it already. Um, the, um, the items that I was addressing as the workload issue really come, come after that. Okay. Um, so while our current PLA um, has promoted safety and efficiency and career pathways in the projects that it's covered, it's only covered about a dozen projects in the two and a half years that it's been effect. Um, what do you estimate to be the number of projects um, if when we, you know, if what this council decides to lower that to one million? I, I, Councilman, thank you for the question. I don't have a forward-looking estimate. However, typically we, um, we're, we're probably, next year will probably be pretty, pretty similar to the prior 12 months. And we would have done, in the prior 12 months, if these rules had been in a place, we would have done an additional 26 
PLA projects. And so I don't know if it's going to be an additional 26 over the next 12 months, but it'll probably be in that general vicinity. There's a lot of um, street maintenance and sewer projects that had previously, previously been exempted that would likely no longer be exempted that made up the bulk of those. Thank you. About, um, sorry, at street, street rehabilitation. I didn't mean to say street maintenance. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to add that amongst jurisdictions in California with PLAs, um, our current threshold at $3 million is very high. The $1 million threshold is in line with Sacramento, San Leandro, Alameda County, <coughs> excuse me, Contra Costa County, and it's still significantly higher than thresholds for many cities with PLAs, including Long Beach and Los Angeles. Um, I, um, I actually um, wanted to make a change on the CPI adjustment to the threshold. Um, and and um, I, one of the things that we had had was um, creating confusion and uncertainty amongst the bidders as to whether a given project is or isn't covered under the PLA. Could you, Matt, um, explain uh, how, how that would make things clearer or not clearer for bidders if we allow the CPI adjustment? Sure, thank you, council member. There may be, um, there's likely folks a different opinion, but in my opinion, when we sent out a project to bid, um, all the bid documents are posted online and it's really clear if it has a PLA or not um, it, to the bidders. And so there may be, um, so I don't, I'm not sure if there will be, con I can't speak to you know the specific bidders, what they're thinking about this, but our documents are very clear that we post online on the city's bid system. And if it has a PLA, it has a PLA. If it doesn't, it's clear that it doesn't. And we can even make that even more clear if, if some folks think it, think it's not already. And so okay, so if you could uh, make it clear, and um, I'm going to ask Councilmember Cohen for an amendment to include an assessment of the CPI adjustment um, when the data comes back in a year, um, so that the council can review that. Thank you. Councilmember, and I have one more comment, yeah. just real quick on. on actually, I just asked actually, Councilmember Cohen. Cohen just, I just stepped asked out. Oh, he oh, did he step out? Back to his chair. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Can you can you repeat your amendment? Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry, you guys. <coughs> um, so uh, it had been my understanding, and I because I think I said this at rules um, at rules committee was that. Um, the CPI adjustment to the threshold caused confusion and uncertainty amongst the bidders as to whether a given project is covered or not. And Matt Kano just said that they can make it clearer in the bidding system. And if I got that wrong, Matt, please correct me. Um, and that he can make that clear in the bid system. And so I asked if you would be okay in um, adding that to the data points that would come back in a year so that the council could assess um, whether that did, you know, whether that was helpful or not. Yeah, that, that's, that's fine. Part of the analysis comes back in a year. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> I just wanna address um, a couple other things. One is, so there, there was some discussion about joint apprenticeship programs and I, Another thing that I wanted to share um, about my experience with the All the Way Home campaign and helping veterans go through the trade orientation program and then um, go into apprenticeships was in talking to a lot of the veterans that applied, um, many had some, some kind of experience in construction, and um, which was awesome because they had you know, they have skills in knowing how to be at work on time and how to work as a team and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things once they were in TOPS was realizing how um, they didn't have really maybe the up-to-date training or had some unsafe work habits because they had never had been like properly trained. One of the things I learned was 
in the apprenticeship program, like everybody starts at the same point and then, you know, moves up. Um, and that was kind of interesting to me um, about safety, about training, about quality. <clears throat> and so um, I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, our memo. Um, and um, I also wanted to point out that I do think that we should resource this correctly. Um, Matt Kano just said in his answers to some of the good questions my colleagues asked was that his division is, is already understaffed as much of our city is. Um, I'm not okay with wage theft. I'm not okay with some of the things that have been going on in our city. And I sure don't wanna use our taxpayer dollars to do that. And so to me, I think that uh, economic recovery, good jobs so that people can, can live and provide for their families. I think that's worth investing in. And I, I do agree and uh, that we need to properly resource this job, this, um, this work. And that's it for me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Cohn, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just have a couple more questions for Matt. Um, there was some language used before about complex processes and this is, um, you know, uh, requires a lot of extra time for staff. And we had a conversation at Rules Committee uh, when this came forward um, where we talked about the difference between enforcement and, and bidding, right? And w whether or not the process of actually bidding becomes more complicated or, or, or not. And my understanding was that you had said that the bidding process really doesn't change that much, doesn't require more staffing to handle PLA or not. Can you first start? We clarify that? That is correct. Okay. So we, we already know that our city doesn't have enough staff for enforcement of labor and labor rules, whether we're on, whether projects are under PLA or not. And I, I do agree that we need to staff that better to enforce better. Um, it's, no, it's not clear to me is whether um, we say because we can't, we don't have enough staff for enforcement, we shouldn't, um, you know, we shouldn't improve the, the project conditions for people that we're hiring to do the projects. And given that it, it, it's not a staffing question for, for the um, bidding itself, um, you know, I think we ought to have that conversation when budget time comes about what we need to do for enforcement. Is, is it true that, that on um, project labor agreement projects, you end up with other sets of eyes also from outside city staff that are helping with enforcement? The that's my understanding is that, that each union has a compliance um, department and I, I can't speak to how involved or not involved they are, but I understand that um, I've heard that they each, they each do and, and, and I understand they're involved, but I, I can't speak to their level of involvement or their level of proactive looking at my projects. So I, I just, so thank you for that. I, I think that it's important, that this is an important consideration for me in, in this expansion is that we end up with I believe uh, less likelihood, fewer chances of abuse by having more projects that are under a project labor agreement, regardless of whether we have the internal staffing to, uh, to fully um, to do the oversight that we would like to do in an ideal, situ in an ideal world. Um, so, so thank you for that answer. I also have a question about training. Um, you know, it's, I know that, for example, that some of the trades offer you know, training for engineering staff that's like a day, a day long, one day program to explain about project labor agreements and, and uh, what they mean and why they are and, and, and how they work. Um, it, it strikes me this is a, a training that can be done, you know, one, sending somebody to a one day program to learn those extra elements of what, it, what these mean for the projects. I'm not clear about this ongoing training need that, be, that, that would be, um, you know, taking up so much time of, of the staff. Sure, thank you for that question. And before you close with your questions, I have one minor clarification I wanna add. But to answer, to answer your question, uh, yeah, uh, David Benny and the Building Trades Council have been great partners over the years, and, and they have offered training, and I'm pretty sure we've taken advantage of that at least one time. And they, and every time I, and David and, and Luis from Working Partnerships, um, they've, I know I can call them, and I know I can get a training with them, and we will definitely take advantage of that. And this is something that it's a whole new world for folks. Um, it's, 
it's um, it's a type of thing if you go to a training on this and you don't use it you're gonna forget about it um, and, and so regular training of the staff um, is is something that will need to happen um, staff don't need to be trained three or four times a year but staff need to be trained uh, heavily a few times at the beginning and then at least an annual check-in I think a lot of the um, a lot of the training need though is going to be what I referenced before which is going to be the um, daily phone calls Chris is going to get from different project managers who are new to the game and want to understand what's going on. So that is more of that. That's probably going to be the heavier training need. Um, the and the, So that yeah, that's my response. Okay. Thank you. Did you have something else you wanted to clarify? Yes. Um, on recommendation number two from um, your and Council Member Sparza's memo, we would, we would prefer to read authorize staff to negotiate and execute additional minor changes. That way we wouldn't have to come back to Council. Yeah, that that that's fine with me. I make sure it's with is with seconder as well. I'm okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. I mean, as we know, as you as we had said before, these these elements of the memo came from you as your recommendation for how to help with the process. Yes, so thank you. And that. then after the attorneys read what I sent you, they told me to <laughs> they advised me to have you add that. Yeah. So. yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for the clarification. Just one last thing, I wanted to clarify the amendment that we talked about before, as far as the exception um, on housing. I just want to clarify exactly what we're we talked for there's been so much going on I want to make sure I understand what um, exemption we had agreed to um, at least your understanding of it sure and I'll address it and then please ask Rachel to weigh in um, the last statement I heard um, was the the consideration of keeping the exemption as is in the PLA um, for building rehab um, I, and I don't know if I don't know that if there was consensus on that or not, but but I that's that's the last I heard that the exemption number, uh, or I'll, I'll call it a, one the exemption for building rehab as currently written in the PLA was going to be considered to be kept. And so that's exemption number six, which exempts building maintenance or rehab, which could include upgrading of the building, and so that would be for any projects. And that's just what I I'm just repeating what I what I heard. I'm not I'm not. I'm not Stating a preference because I had understood it was for housing projects, right? But that I, was that I was the way, that was what I accepted was an understanding. It was yeah, what I, I heard the conversation start as housing projects, but the last statement I heard was related to everything, and that, but that's up, it's up to the mayor and city council. It's not my decision. I just right. No, I just wanted to understand what was on the table for the motion because I thought that it had been specifically about housing projects and the concern that housing projects would be affected by it. So I, I accepted. A motion with the understanding or the amendment of the understanding it was affecting the housing but not all rehab projects so what I what, I, what I'm hearing is that the exemption would stay the same as it is but just specifically before housing re rehab projects if it is accepted I, I understand that okay that oh yeah so councilmember Sparza is that acceptable yes it's just housing correct just housing yeah yeah I think that was councilmember Davis's intention so yes. it was to protect housing I'm okay with that okay thank you I'm done, and I'm, I'm finished with my comments. All right, thank you. Um, Matt, just to want to clarify, first, prevailing wages are required on all city projects, whether it's a PLA or there's not, prevailing wages are required, is that right? Correct. Okay. I want to make sure nobody, seems as though from some of the discussions, some were believing that this was essential to getting people, getting workers prevailing wages, and that's not the case. Correct. Okay. And there are many good union programs that help to um, open the doors for pre-apprentices and apprentices to get into the trades, and those are very important. But there are also non-union programs. And I'm thinking, for example, one I went to over at Goodwill just a few months ago. Um, it was state certified, federally certified. Uh, it was serving primarily through a reentry program, women and men who were coming out of custody. Uh, and I heard a very moving story from a woman who about her battles with addiction. She was living at one of our tiny homes, tiny home communities, and she was in a pre-apprentice program and, and getting a job for the first time in several years. Um, and my concern is about that program, which was non-union. My understanding is under what we were be considering today, um, we could not hire, have anyone hire someone out of that program on a city project with the restrictions on apprenticeships. 
Is, 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 am I, my misunderstanding? Uh, that's my understanding as well. Uh, any prevailing wage uh, project requires uh, efforts, good faith efforts to meet 25% apprentices uh, of the work hours. And my understanding would be uh, that those, in, those apprentices would not be able to be utilized on that project. Because they have to have the joint union um, uh, agreement, is that, is that right? That is correct. Okay, union contractor, I should say. So I, I have a concern about that. I, I want to just be very clear about it because, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong on this, but not only do we think construction trades are a really important path for an awful lot of young people uh, who may be out of school and are trying to find a path, but right now we have a huge construction labor shortage. Is that, is that fair to say? That's our assumption because prices seem to be going up in construction as well. Okay, I, I certainly hear about it, that concern from contractors, from developers, from lots of folks. Are you hearing similar concerns about the difficulty of getting skilled trades? On the, skill, the skilled items on our recent bids, those projects requiring skilled labor have come in a lot higher. So um, my take on it is, my conclusion is the same, but I haven't heard the direct comments, but the skilled labor projects have been coming in a lot higher in our bids, which correlates to the lack of people that can do that work. Right. And, and we all agree that wage violations are abhorrent and we, they should be, we should be strictly enforcing uh, and certainly debarring contractors or engaging in them willfully. Um, but we've had some experience with wage violations even on projects with PLAs in recent years, haven't we? We do have a, a notice of violation out on, on two of the PLA projects um, that has, is still under review and has not been yet finalized. Okay, in both of those projects, as I recall, because I was close to them since they're housing projects for unhoused people that I was close to, uh, both of those, as I recall, or at least one of the contractors was a nonprofit uh, dedicated to building affordable housing uh, and clearly, um, clearly not looking to get a, get a fast buck. Is that fair to say? It was... Yeah, yeah, we're, these are both open investigations. They haven't been yeah. concluded yet, so um, I'll, I'll probably find okay. a Okay, I understand comment. you can't comment much. Okay, so I guess my concern is, is that if we think the PLAs are panacea for, for wage violations, so far that hasn't been our experience. So of the PLA projects, those are the two instances that we're aware of. Um, those, okay. those two and notices of violations, I'm not currently aware of uh, violations on any other projects, and we did a little research and we couldn't find them. Okay. And, and I appreciate, you know, neither Council Member Mahan nor Council Member Cohen were on the council at the time, but we did engage in a very lengthy process the first time around when we came to this policy. Uh, and I remember it very well because I remember being in the room negotiating uh, alongside Dave Sykes, and I think you were in the room too, weren't you, Matt? Yes, I came in during about halfway through those negotiations halfway to my through. role as public works director. And then, and then, as you—that's right, because you had just come, become director, and then eventually you sort of took over the working out some of the details. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Correct. Okay, and so we negotiated in good faith with, um, and, and I think also the building trades negotiated in good faith with us, uh, and very productive conversations. And in those conversations. And I know you weren't in all of them. You said you came in part of the way, but there were a number of exemptions that were created. Uh, those are articulated in the, the addendum C to, to uh, things like street maintenance, sewer maintenance, municipal water, airport maintenance, on call, building maintenance, rehab. Um, do you recall why it was important for city staff that there were exemptions? I. This exemption list was created and provided to me when I took my role as public works director, okay. uh, so I wasn't involved in the creation of it. I was definitely involved in the um, maintaining maintaining it, and we tweaked it a little bit when I when I started negotiating the agreement directly with the Building Trades Council. I think part of it was the fear, was the city we didn't know uh, we we didn't know what we didn't know about uh, um, PLAs um, and and the city wanted to step into it, um, is my understanding, with a more limited number of projects. And so that's kind of the best of my recollection. 
Okay, and then there was a $3 million threshold that was set, obviously through negotiation. You recall how we got there and, and why, why we thought that was important, having a threshold at $3 million. Part of that, to my recollection, was also because we weren't sure about the cost impacts, uh, if there were any, of having a PLA on a project. Um, and there's, I mean, if you just go on Google and Google PLA, you're going to find um, articles on, on both sides of that. Um, and staff did a lot of research in 2018, 17, 2018, to try and get council a good answer to that. And really, at the end of the day, um, staff was not able to provide council back in 2018 a great answer of that. And, and I think the, um, also, although we have, I think, 12, around 12 projects currently with PLAs, the dollar value currently of the PLA projects is pretty massive. Um, and so um, I think council also at the time realized that although there were going to be exceptions, from a dollar standpoint, especially since the regional wastewater facility has some massive projects, which moving forward, most if not all are going to be PLAs under the current rules. Right. Um, uh, we are getting um, a lot of impact on the workers, um, even with the exemptions. That was my understanding at the time. Yeah. And, and we, we, as I recall, and my conversations with Dave, and I assume you had these conversations too, you know, we believed that PLAs were appropriate in those large, complex projects because you needed to have really good coordination uh, with unions deeply engaged to ensure you could make those complex projects move um, and have the workers ready to go when you needed to make those, um, when, when you needed to. Uh, is, is that fair to say? That is, that is fair to say, yes. Okay. So I want to at least enable folks who maybe came into that conversation, I mean, didn't have the benefit of that conversation, um, at least to be aware of what the rationale was some of us were thinking about when we adopted the PLA requirement with a fairly modest threshold, I think, of $3 million to capture those large complex projects. Um, now, I don't know if you were in these negotiations at the time or not, but I know in the negotiation itself, in, in the document that I brought before the council, we had an exemption for affordable housing as well. Uh, that, that didn't make it into the ordinance, I guess we learned after the fact, months later. Uh, you recall that, Matt? Yes, I, I think at the time, uh, my, as I've, I've thought that back on that a few times and, and in the past year, um, year and a half, Public Works wasn't really in the affordable housing construction, so right. I'm not sure that we envisioned getting into the affordable housing construction. And then when the pandemic hit, um, we definitely got knee deep in it, and we really, the city started delivering a lot more projects, and we'll continue to do that in the future. And so I think part of the reason, even though I think it was discussed as an exemption, the reason it never made it onto the formal lists, I'm assuming is because, at least I think it was discussed as an exemption, I was in the room, but I think it's just because we didn't envision that scenario that it ended up happening. Well, it did make it on the list, as I recall, in the okay. negotiation that we had before it was brought to council. Okay. Yeah, um, so it was clearly there, and that was documents and public documents, so I think it's fairly clear, but when you subsequently negotiated the details, it wasn't top of mind for you because Public Works at the time wasn't in the affordable housing. Yeah, list. I was just looking at what got adopted by council, the exemption list, and since it didn't end up on what was adopted by council as exemption list, it didn't, didn't. It, it didn't make it in the ordinance that was adopted by council, but clearly the, the documents were presented to council that included the negotiated agreement. Is that right? I, I, so let me just I, offer yeah, my I, own I, recollection because I, I understand I, you came in halfway through. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall that. There, there was an agreement. <laughs> there was signed. It was brought before the Rules Committee. It's a public document, so anybody can check the record and include an affordable housing exemption because it was important in the affordable housing community. They had real concerns, the builders did, about how this would drive up costs and their ability to get labor, and particularly those developers and builders who were doing things like prefab and modular to try to grapple with those costs. They thought PLAs created real challenges for them to be able to use, to be able to get labor that could be flexibly deployed with new skills and doing different processes than normal because PLAs were pretty rigid. So there was 
an exemption. We agreed to it. It never made it into the ordinance. I understand why, because as you said, it's not top of mind of public works because you're thinking about public works projects. But at least that's what was presented publicly. And I recall signing it and, and bringing it before the Rules Committee. So I guess where I'm going with all this is I am concerned. I'm concerned we've got more costs that city staff will obviously need to take on, um, and we're going to have to find money in the budget. Uh, we've got to have more staff to negotiate and manage the PLAs. Um, I'd rather be spending that money actually enforcing wage violations than, than on you know, the shuffling the paper, but uh, instead we're going to spend it on negotiating and managing the PLAs. Um, you know, staff was asked about this, and they, they asked to yellow light this to enable them to analyze it and bring council the best information and do outreach, as staff typically does. And instead, this went straight to council. Um, there hasn't been any outreach to the construction industry, so nobody really knows that we're having this discussion, to my knowledge. I just had a very, very brief text exchange with one representative, and that's it because I don't think a lot of folks even know much about this. Uh, we're at a time of rapidly rising construction costs, and we're seeing that in our bidding, certainly. Uh, we're seeing significant labor shortage, uh, and I, as far as I can tell, this is gonna make it worse because we don't have the ability to use non-union apprentices. That is, contractors don't, who are subject to these PLAs. Uh, as it is, even union contractors are reporting they're having a hard time getting enough skilled people uh, to be able to do PLA jobs. And typical PLA limits contractors using only five non-union workers and on a job on a rotating basis. So that limits opportunity for people who struggling, who may want a job, that's important. And it also limits the access of builders to be able to get uh, skilled labor to be able to do the work. And that means everything slows down, costs of the city rise, and sometimes it means when there's not enough money, some public projects just don't get built. Uh, so I guess, you know, my comments come from a certain history because I was in the middle of these negotiations and we spent a lot of time, we went several months of these negotiations and then brought it to council. Now, I could be wrong. I think the council unanimously or near unanimously approved this. And we did so in an understanding that we had an agreement. Uh, and, you know, agreements after extensive negotiation still should mean something in this world. Uh, agreements after negotiations are the subject of compromise. And that happened only two years ago. And a lot of the concerns that would be voiced, for example, by affordable housing builders and others that would be typically considered when we want to change a policy like this can't be considered because this is rushed. And we're now faced with this with no staff significant no staff analysis and no outreach uh, in the community. So um, I'm happy to keep the, the, my commitment to the agreement we made two years ago. Uh, I'm not, not inclined to support this. Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, I've been sitting here listening to the conversation and the debate and Matt, your comments and, and all of my council colleagues comments and I'm actually very concerned that while I definitely support the need to protect our workers' rights and our workers' pay to make sure they're adequately being paid and compensated. I completely support that. But I think that, that given the questions that have been asked and the, the nuances of this proposal, I'm really concerned that this didn't come to CED before we are having this discussion here where we could further vet the issues. I'm concerned that there is a lack of outreach and I'm concerned at the effect on affordable housing and how that will affect the cost of construction. So I, I've listened to all of this and I'm wondering if the maker of the motion would consider a friendly amendment. And that would be that we refer this to CED for a report back uh, to the CED committee in February for then a report back to uh, council following that. Um, no, that's, not, that's, I don't, um, won't accept that a friendly amendment. We'll take a vote on this and see where it goes. Okay, council okay thanks.
Uh, Councilmember Mahan. Yeah, I mean, I was going the same direction. I, I'd, I'd like to uh, make a substitute motion that we refer this item to CED so we can get proper staff analysis as per the yellow light that staff gave us. I generally pay attention to those things and that we have time to do outreach to the many stakeholders who have no idea that we're having this conversation, have not been able to weigh in and offer their perspective. And that we also have at least, uh, in, as part of that staff analysis, some understanding of how else staff resources might be deployed to improve enforcement, for example, is maybe a better alternative than simply restricting um, non-union contractors in good standing from even bidding on these projects. So I'd, I would um, like to make that substitute motion now. Right. Substitute motion from Councilmember Mayhan, second from Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Perales, and then we'll go to Councilmember Moranis on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll have to shift my comments slightly uh, based on the new motion. Um, I, I won't support this this motion, and I, I do understand that this current council was not the full council that was there, so we have a couple new members that weren't privy to that discussion. Um, Mayor, I, I think you, you may be recalling the conversations you were having with the negotiations, because uh, obviously you were, you were having those, but the conversation on the dais was not unanimous. In fact, it was a six to five vote, um, and I know that I was, I was on the, the five side of it. I had an additional memo myself. Uh, in a different perspective, as I shared here in the beginning, that um, I felt, and we, we had quite a lengthy argument, as you know, in regards to, uh, I think, the, the merits and the concerns of PLAs. Uh, and as Matt has stated, you can actually find uh, opposing uh, arguments on either side of, of that. But quite frankly, I think the data is very much clear in regards to the benefits of project labor agreements. And, and in this case, the threshold that was, was one of the biggest issues for me um, because of the number of the projects that it would impact. And as we've heard already, um, that the, the variance as far as what the concern on uh, the arguments were a couple years ago when we passed this in, in the cost potential overages has not come to fruition. And uh, unfortunately, the number of projects that we've been able to capture is very minimal. And uh, that was, was my main concern. I, I think that um, I personally don't have an interest in sort of rehashing that same discussion from whatever it was, three, four years ago. Uh, in regards to the, the, the policy debate that we have an opportunity to decide on today. Um, and and uh, so with that, I'll, I'll leave my, my comments at that for now, and, and I won't be able to support this substitute motion. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, I'm certainly quite willing to say I stand corrected if I misunderstood or misrecalled um, the vote on, on that council. Uh, as I say, it was a while ago. So if there was a 6-5 vote, um, I'm going to assume you're right on that, Councilmember Perales, because frankly, I've been on the council too long and all the votes pretty mushed together. All right, one way or another, the council approved it. That's all I remember. All right, uh, Councilmember Arenas. Thank you. Um, I'm also listening to this conversation. It does remind me of a couple of years back. It feels more than, than two years, um, but I think that's just the pandemic time. Um, and so I recall it the same way that Council Member Perales just um, laid out and that it was actually something that we were, um, er, it was pretty controversial in terms of where we wanted to land. Um, and 3 million wasn't where I was supportive um, around. I know that we also worked on having um, having a master agreement to hire core members. I believe it was five core members um, for those employers, um, a targeted hire um, agreement and the term being five years. Um, and so there was a lot of work that was already done. I'm not sure if it's in the same um, room as you were having those um, conversations or those that negotiation um mayor but the the one that i was in was here on the dais and i know that we heard from a lot of folks who came into the chambers and talked about the benefits of not only being in a union but um making sure that that they have um an ability or those folks who, who are employers in those union jobs have an ability of contracting with the city of San Jose, as we are probably one of the biggest employers um, in the same way that the county is one of the biggest employers for the county. Um, 
and and so so anyways uh it 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 really um created some lines um for for many of us i think there was people who didn't talk to each other for a while after this i know i was very upset about it and in the end i i all all and i am including the, this because in I know what it is to be in a working family, and I know how important it is to have union jobs. And so I'm in line with, with the underlying um, motion uh, on the floor, um, but I did have um, a couple of questions because I was concerned about what um, you had said, Mayor, about, um, I think it was, um, the inability of, of maybe some of the apprentice, the union apprentice programs being able to rise up um, and, uh, and take on the challenge that we're, um, we're seeing ahead of us. And so I wanted to see if maybe there was somebody, obviously I'm not in the chambers, but if there was anybody um, in the chambers or on the line um, that could answer that question, I think the, maybe the most appropriate person would be David Beanie or Jean Cohen. Tony, is there anybody on the line with those names that I could ask a question? Yes. Yes, go ahead. So David Beanie is allowed to speak. I'm here, council members. Uh, uh, wonderful. I think you heard my question, right? Yes, uh, uh, just to clarify, it's, it's a, a concern about the uh, ability for uh, the unionized workforce and the apprenticeships to provide labor. Is that? Is that um... Right, we, we're, you know, there was a concern um, because I, I know, and, um, you know, I love the Goodwill um, uh, Agency, and I think there was a, there was a, a concern that their apprenticeship program wouldn't qualify for their, um, for this, for, for, for PLAs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, separate from that, there was a, also a concern that there wasn't going to be enough maybe apprentices um, with the unions to, um, to fill jobs um, and, the, and the requirements of, of a PLA. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me tackle that in two parts. Thank you for the question, council member. So the uh, Goodwill program is not an approved apprenticeship under the state of California. It's uh, actually a pre-apprenticeship program, which uh, can certainly feed uh, the, uh, the, apprentice, the apprenticeable trades. Uh, and I think uh, most, uh, most often it uh, is able to feed a, uh, apprentices into the, uh, the laborers local 270 program. Uh, so we're appreciative of that. Uh, the, the PLA won't affect that one way or another. In fact, uh, uh, if anything, it will increase the ability for the laborers to bring in new apprentices, not, not only from the Goodwill program, but also mm -hmm. from other pre-apprenticeship programs. Uh, and that's the, the second part of the question. Oh, so these are, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So these are pre-apprentice apprenticeship uh, programs. They're not the form a formal apprenticeship program. Uh, the Goodwill one, yeah, the, that's the only one I, I know that we're, that's the only one I heard referenced, and that, that is correct. That is not an a, a approved apprenticeship program. It's a pre-apprenticeship. Got it. Okay, um, go ahead and continue. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, part of the calculation that all of the apprenticeships, uh, all the joint apprenticeships make, is a calculation on, on how many apprentices that can be kept working uh, through, the, through to graduation. Now, one of the things that joint apprenticeships do very well is making sure that, uh, that the folks that get brought into the apprenticeship graduate so that they can actually have a good family supporting career. And when there are more PLA projects on the books and the apprenticeship, uh, the, the labor side and the management side can see that there's enough work to support more apprentices, more apprentices are brought into those trades from programs like Goodwill, uh, from other pre-apprenticeship programs or from uh, direct applicants. Uh, so uh, by including more PLA projects uh, from the city's capital improvement program, we'll actually increase that pipeline. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. Oh, that's that's great to hear um, because I would I would hate to think that that the 
the great work that Goodwill is doing would, um, would be lost. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I, I think those are the, my questions. Um, David, thank you uh, for jumping on. Yes, you're welcome. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to hear that there is a clarification for that because I want, you know, I want to make sure that what we're doing is also benefiting, benefiting the programs that are supporting our community currently. And so it sounds like it would, it, it's already feeding into this union um, system and um, having, like you've just heard, more PLAs will increase that direct or, or indirect recruitment. And so um, for, the, for that, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, to have the clarity. Um, the, the second thing that I was wondering, um, and I know that, that we can't talk about, um, because I also had some questions about um, the allegations of wage theft from um, the contractor involved in the tiny homes. Um, and so I, I hope that soon enough we'll be able to hear what is the process that it's currently going through before I move on from that from that subject. Uh, I just wanted to learn from you, Matt, if you're able to tell me, what is that process that they're going through right now? Is that our internal process? Sure, thank you, Councilmember, for the question. And so um, the, the process is an initial notice of violation is and was sent out. Um, and then they, then whoever we send the notice of violation out has the ability to respond. Um, and then sometimes that response um, is kind of, hey, we're all in agreement here. Here's the resolution and let's close this out really quickly. Sometimes it, it's not that straightforward. Um, and additional information is provided in that response, which changes um, what the outcome for the workers could be. And additionally, um, uh, often it, um, on the larger issues, lawyers from both sides get involved as well. Um, and so, to which isn't the case here. Um, and so, to answer your question, um, we are in the process of awaiting the response to our most recent notice. And once we get that response, which should be shortly, we will be able to better understand our action plan for moving this forward to resolution. Um, it is does it does eat at me that there are workers um, that, that we still need to get money to. And, and it is really important for Chris and I to bring this to resolution as quick as we can. It, it, it is very important to us. Do you think that this will get resolved before Christmas? after the new year i mean i don't have an est um, not before christmas um council member but but um mm -hmm. i don't have an estimated timeline other than the commitment that i can give you all that we're going to work really hard to resolve it as quickly as we can yeah um without uh you know with in line with with protecting and and keeping people's um um Confident, uh, confidentiality and, and their names and all that. I just wonder if there's any way that what we could do is um, in the same way that we enroll um, families to a Christmas giving um, program, if there's something similar that we can do for these families um, that, we, that we know are not having a portion of their income into their household. Um, and so it, it is, for me, it's important to figure that piece out. Um, is there any way that we can do something um, like that? Council member, it's, it's, it's my, I, I understand oh, where- I'm sorry. Uh, David, oh. uh, Beanie, uh, uh, your mic is on. Yeah. Okay, council member Rez. Sure, sorry. I, I didn't want that uh, background noise to keep interrupting you. Okay. Yes. Matt, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember, and I'll ask Nora to maybe help me out if I don't say the right thing here. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from. My my professional um, recommendation is that we 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 need to focus on closing out this investigation and 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 not mix it with um, other interactions mm -hmm. with the workers that may be impacted. There's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts here, and I think that could complicate it. Mm -hmm. Sure. I understand. Um, it's just, you know, those are families uh, potentially that have children. And um, and uh, if, we, if we didn't have um, a couple of our paychecks, um, we would um, be impacted, certainly. 
Um, so I'll, uh, uh, and I'll take that offline. I wonder um, if there's any other, um, anybody else out there that could help these families um, that wouldn't compromise our, our, um, our role. So I, I'm just gonna move on to my last question. And that is, um, I was interested in the, the convo that, um, that talked about the debarment and, um, I was wondering what when was the last time that we debarred um, a company, and and for what? Thank you. The last time we debarred, we've only debarred somebody once in the past twenty or so years, and it was uh, to my uh, for public works projects. To my understanding, Nora can correct me. It was a couple years ago when it was for submitting falsified. Um, it was our understanding that they submitted falsified certified payrolls, and that that was our reason for debarment. And that happened uh, two or three years ago. And and, mm -hmm. and I will add, it's tied up in litigation. Boy. Um, so I know that this is one of the ways that we can um, continue to support and, and prevent maybe some wage theft is uh, the certified payroll. Where are we um, with, with um, making sure that we have um, what we need, like that database um, in order to help us out. I know in one year, we're gonna come back and we're gonna take a look at this, but um, Council Member Collins said earlier, um, you know, we, we have, if we recognize where we are short in terms of um, staffing, um, that, that we need to make sure that we have what we need in order to be successful. Otherwise, we'll come back in a year and I know where what that report could possibly look like if we don't have all the tools um, that we need um, to make sure that, that we certify um, some of that payroll, that we have enough um, staff that goes out there and does those, you know, um, uh, on-site visits um, sporadically. A anyways, where are we with that, with the, um, with the database map? Thank you, Councilman, for the question. And there was, there was, I know there was discussion on that at the recent budget discussion. And my understanding, I was looking up my computer to find out the exact direction, but I'm under, I think we received direction to come back at mid-year with a report on exactly what we felt that would cost and if the funding was available or not. Um, and so concurrent with, oh. Yeah, that's correct, Matt. Thank you. And then in the um, in the meantime, in Public Works, uh, our our team is discussing that right now, so that we'll be ready to report back at mid year, um, which is February, I think, at Council. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it seems like um, uh, providing the tools to our department um, staff and teams are is what really we need to focus on aside from increasing these PLAs um, because we want to make sure that this is successful but um, even with the PLA um, uh, being uh, uh, three million up to three million and, and not the change that we're asking uh, for today there still isn't um, advancement in some of the tools that are our departments need to get the job done and to be able to say we're successful in, in doing those things. Um, so, so anyways, I, it, I'm going to support the underlying motion because it makes sense. It, it, it puts people to work. It feeds a system of apprenticeship. It also um, provides uh, some additional opportunities for um, smaller agencies that could take on a, a lower um, uh, number in terms of of a project, um, and so I, I it's it's great for small businesses. It's great for our union families, um, and I think with PLAs, it also will allow for us to continue to work on those internal tools to help monitor um, the certificate, the certified payroll, and the, the other tools that we need in order to make sure that um, folks earn that prevailing wage that we so, um, you know, so that we tout so much about. If we are not certifying that, um, there's no reason for us to be proud about that, that prevailing wage if we can't say we, that we're confirming that on an ongoing basis. 
So anyways, uh, those were my questions, my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, Tony, uh, Nicole Gehring is um, one of the attendees, and I just wanted to ask her to, if she could to clarify between the apprenticeship program and the pre-apprenticeship program, I understand there is a state and federally approved apprenticeship program that folks in the pre-apprenticeship program would go into from Goodwill. And the problem is, once they become apprentices, they cannot get hired uh, if this provision passes. So, Nicole, are, are you on? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity. We have a partnership with Goodwill. And just to clarify, Goodwill is not the uh, the approved, is not an apprenticeship program. They, hi they partner with people in the community to teach the apprenticeship program. So they have hired us and we are a state and federally approved apprenticeship program providing our curriculum. It's the first year apprentice curriculum to the pre-apprenticeship students at Goodwill. And from there, if they are so interested to join our apprenticeship program, they join our apprenticeship program. And that is what, what um, I am clarifying. So for example, we have the Vietnam veteran that we just uh, taught and also an, another woman who just passed their labor intake exams who will be going into our apprenticeship program, which is a state federally approved program, which <clears throat> if the uh, language is uh, approved today in item D of the request, that will exclude our programs from being able to uh, work on the public works projects at the city of San Jose, because we are not a joint program. We are a unilateral program, but state and federally approved. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Nicole. And thanks for the work that you're doing with Goodwill and Partnership. Uh, so I, I think, look, we understand no policy is perfect, it never can be, but these are the kinds of considerations we'd wanna take up if we had the time, obviously in, uh, reaching out to our community, allowing staff to do their work. Uh, that's why I'm gonna support the motion from Councilmember Mayhan. Councilmember Perales? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll rest. Sorry, thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, Council Member uh, Rains, your hand's still up. I'm going to assume it's from last time. Uh, yes. Okay. Let's vote first on the motion from Council Member Mahan. Jimenez? No. Prowlis? No. Cohen? No. Crosco? No. Davis? Yes. Esparza? No. Arenas? No. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, so we'll return to the underlying motion. And let me just ask the maker of the motion, is there any willingness to amend to enable programs like the one we just heard to be able to participate uh, and be hired in PLA projects? I guess I'm not. 100% clear about what that looks like in a, in a statement in terms of enabling program. I mean, I, I well, don't know. Well, we, we'd have to allow staff probably to come I mean, back with us to, to work that out, but. but I mean, I, I'd be willing to make a motion to, to bring forward to ECD the, the question of, of, you know, that apprenticeship question for discussion there, and then we'll bring it to council. And then I, I would also amend my motion to suggest that the report that we're talking about bringing back in a year comes to ECD in the fall for discussion there before we bring it back to council in terms of the effects of, of uh, project of this change. Okay, to go to CED uh, and Councilor Esparza. CED, I meant yeah. not ECD. Yeah, <laughs> Councilor Esparza, obviously a minor procedural uh, change. I assume that's all right with you? Yes. Okay, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, actually, I, I, I was gonna have a request along those same lines. Um, uh, going back when we originally had that uh, that discussion with with labor, um, there was a willingness to um, incorporate that in the PLA. Uh, there was a recognition that it's a good thing to lift all boats, whether you know wh whatever apprenticeship program that someone comes through. So um, I want to kind of try to just throw out a compromise, and that is to leave um, the language in, in the PLA like it is, have it come back to CED for a further evaluation. So that's my friendly amendment compromise. All right, that's to Councilman Cohen. Um, I, I mean, well, I guess I'm not quite sure I understand. You're suggesting not changing, not. Not making a change now. 
but having to go to CED for further analysis. Well, that, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I said with my amendment, but we can figure out when the timing is, I said, by the fall to make sure that there's time to evaluate the effects. But if you want to have it be discussed sooner than the fall, I mean, I can leave that up to CED about when it should be discussed at CED. I'm not, I'm not as focused on the timing as I am about maintaining that in, in the PLA until we have that discussion in, in oh, oh, maintaining the current language and not exactly. accepting the changes. No, exactly. I'm not, that's not a friendly amendment to the motion. Sorry, I mean, won't accept it. Thank you. Okay, amendment declined. Can, uh, Vice Mayor, did you have anything more? Uh, just, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I share, you know, the, obviously the concerns that I raised and um, the concerns that my colleagues have raised in terms of the process. I, I'm actually going to vote to um, uh, accept uh, the motion on the floor uh, with the expectation and understanding that when we come back in a year or when it comes back to CED that there's a, um, an effort to really take the data that we're getting and have a, a real thorough evaluation and if there's other changes that need to be made, if we need to adjust, make adjustments, that there's a, a good faith uh, effort to do that based on the data that we see. So that, that's it, Mayor. Councilmember Pross? Yeah, I actually appreciate that perspective. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's similar to, to sort of what happened here. There was a lot of, I think, concerns on, on what this might mean. And, and none of those concerns really came to fruition. And, and so expanding it, I think, to where there was a divide um, and, 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 and allowing it to actually, I think, uh, be more beneficial than it is today was, was my hope. And so I'm glad we're, we're moving forward the direction as is. Um, and, and I think um, just to highlight, I know that this has been, appeared to be maybe a bit difficult or controversial, but when we debated it last time, I, I looked back and it was several hours. We actually had a motion and an underlying motion and both of those failed. Uh, and then we ultimately uh, had a, 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 a subsequent motion that passed six to five. It, it was extremely controversial, I think, based on policy then, um, much like I think we're, we're hearing today. Um, and, and I think that we need to be able to push it uh, where I was hoping we could have four years ago. And um, I'm glad that we have the motion on the, on the table now and we'll support it. Thanks. Councilman Pross, when you said four years ago, that sort of tipped me off. We did have a controversial discussion, six five vote in 2017. What I was referring to was 2019, when we implemented this policy. And so I think it's important to contrast the two. I don't think you're saying anything different than me. What I was saying was we went through a lengthy negotiation, brought it to the council. I don't require, recall that discussion being controversial when we came to vote on this PLA policy after lengthy negotiation, outreach, and public discussion. And that's when you're implementing a policy like this that literally precludes some people uh, from being able to uh, make a living, that's, that's something I think we owe them. Could I ask for two points of clarification before yes, I vote? Yes, Matt. Thank you. One point, I'm, I, on coming back to CED, I'd like a little bit of flexibility, definitely within about a year. However, if we come back in the fall, by the time we execute this agreement, it gets signed by the city and all the unions. It's going to still take a while to get this agreement signed, even with the clear direction we may be getting, if we get the clear direction today. And by the fall, we're not gonna have many months of data. So if there's a little bit of flexibility and when we come back to CED, that'd be appreciated. Also, I'm not clear on where the recommendation is regarding apprentices. I think right now it's just to adopt what is in your memorandum, Council Member Cohen. That's right. With, okay. with, uh, we, I asked for a report to CED on the various urban apprentice programs and, and okay. how they... So when we come back to CED, we'll report... Or, yeah, I mean, that can okay. work out with CED on the timing. Okay. okay. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlers? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? No. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? No. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to item. Actually, you know what? Uh, we're now well into the lunch, well past the lunch hour. Uh, let me just check in with my colleagues.
I know there were sandwiches back there. Uh, I didn't get a chance, but did anybody else not get a chance to eat? <laughs> we've, already, we've already eaten. We should just Everybody else ate? Okay. All right. Well, I'll just sneak back there during a, during a, a low point here. Or, uh, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, good luck, right? Uh, oh, no, that's fine. I, I just wanted to check in. Has everyone had a chance to eat? I think that's the real I, question. I don't know if all of us had. What's that? I, don't, I haven't. I don't know if all of us had. Okay. Why don't, why don't we just take a 10-minute, 15-minute break? Okay, we'll be back at uh, 2.10. Great.